Welcome to the UCL Center for Anesthesia student podcast series. Prescribing analgesia for the surgical patient. In this podcast, discussion will include an introduction to pain and why we treat it, assessing pain, pharmacological management, systemic analgesia, managing opioid side effects, epidurals, patient controlled analgesia, and a few case scenarios at the end. Pain in the context of this podcast is a conscious feeling of discomfort that acts as a warning mechanism for bodily injury. The reason for analgesia before, during, and especially after an operation is because a patient may be in severe pain. Not only is it extremely unpleasant, but it can also hinder the recovery process. It's ideal to anticipate and prevent pain rather than wait for it to occur and then give treatment. Anesthetists and nurses on the post-op ward commonly practice multimodal analgesia, which is the use of a combination of drugs at lower doses. Different drugs work via different pathways, and lowering the doses of each can help prevent serious side effects without compromising the pain relief. When formulating a plan of multimodal analgesia, don't be afraid to ask a specialist or a more experienced colleague for help. Good pain management is not only important for humanitarian reasons, it may also have significant benefits like reduced sympathetic activity, incidence of coronary syndromes, risk of tachycardia and dysrhythmia, respiratory complications, thromboembolic events, and chronic pain syndromes, as well as improved patient satisfaction, wound healing, mobilization, and hospital discharge. There are four common methods used in assessing acute pain. The first is a visual analog scale, which is scored between no pain and worst possible pain. A verbal response scale is similar, but instead is correlated with words, for example, mild, severe, excruciating, or to a number, like two out of four. At UCH, pain scoring from zero to four is most commonly used. Autonomic responses, like tachycardia, hypertension, and sweating, as well as dynamic pain scores, like pain on movement, ability to take a deep breath, or the ability to cough, can be very helpful in assessing a patient's pain level. Pain treatment. There are three main components to treating pain. Physical treatment, which is pretty self-explanatory, includes things like putting a splint on a broken bone, applying a cold compress, acupuncture, or hypnosis. There is also a psychological component, reassuring a patient that everything is going as planned or explaining why they're having pain or why they're taking a certain drug can really have an effect on a patient's pain perception. Pharmacological treatment, which this podcast is most focused on, involves the drugs prescribed to a patient for pain relief. The analgesia ladder, which we will discuss in more detail in just a moment, is used frequently by anesthetists in combination with other systemically acting drugs. Another method is regional anesthesia, which only works on a certain area of the body. An example of this is an epidural, which can be used during and after surgery. Pharmacological management, systemic analgesia. A very important tool in prescribing analgesia is the analgesia ladder, which can be seen here. It was initially devised for cancer pain, but has been widely adapted for post-operative use. The aim is to step down the ladder as the time after surgery increases. Right after surgery, the patient will be in a lot of pain and may need a strong opioid like morphine in combination with a weaker opioid and a simple painkiller. Later, as recovery begins, they can move down to just the weaker opioid, for example, codeine or tramadol, and a non-opioid, and then eventually to just the simple painkiller. Going back to multimodal analgesia, which I mentioned earlier, different combinations of the different drug types can be used depending on the patient's pain levels. Here's a chart with many of the commonly used analgesic drugs and some details about each. I don't feel like it will be helpful to read them off, but if you wish to pause the video and take a look, please do so now. Some additional adjuvants like antinox, ketamine, gabapentin, and amitriptyline are frequently used as well. With systemic analgesia, it is ideal to avoid the intramuscular route if at all possible, as it is painful to the patient and absorption of the drug can vary. In other words, oral analgesia is advocated. Managing opioid side effects. Additional prescriptions may need to be written for the side effects a patient experiences from taking opioids. Keep in mind, side effects will be more common in older patients. The best strategy for treating significant side effects is to reduce the dose by 25 to 50 percent. Here are examples of treatments for some common side effects. For constipation, a laxative or stool softener can be given. If a patient is confused, withhold further doses and possibly lower the dose or substitute it for a different drug that is shorter acting. 
In addition, check for other potential causes of confusion, like electrolyte abnormalities, hypoxemia, dehydration, or infection. If the patient experiences nausea, you can use antihistamines, anticholinergic, and dopamine antagonist antiemetics. Lastly, respiratory depression might occur. This is classified as less than 8 respirations per minute and is usually preceded by sedation. It may be a sign of opioid overdose, so be sure to check for that. In an emergency, naloxone is the best treatment. An epidural is an infusion of local anesthetic, often with an opioid like morphine or fentanyl. It is a catheter inserted about 4 centimeters into the epidural space. This is done by an anesthetist in theater, and the catheter is left in for a few days after surgery. Epidurals can be used in abdominal, urogenital, and obstetric surgeries, to name a few. Its benefits include great pain relief and decreased respiratory complications, risk of venous thrombosis, and short-term morbidity. Some side effects of epidurals include motor paralysis and hypotension. The infusion rate of an epidural is usually around 5 to 15 milliliters per hour. Intravenous fluids must also be given, and urinary catheterization may be required. Before an epidural removal, it is essential to start the patient on alternative analgesia. Patient-Controlled Analgesia PCA is a preset machine that allows a patient to press a button in order to deliver opioid analgesia in small boluses. The machine is very safe, and this type of analgesia has a high patient satisfaction rate, which is thought to be partially psychological. It is used postoperatively until the patient is able to tolerate oral analgesia. While it is useful, specialists don't like to keep a patient on a PCA too long because being hooked up to a machine can inhibit the patient's mobility and therefore may actually increase their recovery time. They will try to get the patient on oral medication as soon as possible. Now let's take a look at a few case scenarios. The first is a fit and well 40-year-old woman who has had an inguinal hernia repair in day surgery. She is unable to be discharged because of her pain. What are the potential solutions? At this time, take a moment to pause the video and have a think about what analgesia might be appropriate in this situation. To start, you may want to prescribe regular paracetamol at 1 gram 4 times daily and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug as well as oral morphine PRN every 3-4 to four hours. If the patient is nil by mouth, you could try administering the morphine intravenously at 1-2 to two milligram boluses every 5 minutes. Be sure to stay with the patient and consult a senior colleague if necessary. Ensure the patient has intravenous fluids and adequate antiemetics. If none of the above methods are working, setting up a PCA might be beneficial. Keep in mind, the amount of analgesia necessary will depend on whether the surgery is open or laparoscopic. An open surgery most times requires more analgesia over a laparoscopic procedure. As in any case, don't be afraid to contact a more experienced anesthetist for advice. The second case scenario, a 23-year-old intravenous drug user is admitted for incision and drainage of an abscess. What analgesia can be used? Again, take a moment to brainstorm your own solution before continuing. The first thing you could do is prescribe some paracetamol and non anti-inflammatory drugs preoperatively. Local anesthetics may also be an option before surgery. If the patient is on methadone, which is a treatment for heroin addiction, this may be prescribed regularly. You can confirm the dose with the patient's GP if necessary. A good thing to try first might be tramadol at 100 mg orally. Morphine can be given for extreme pain, orally or intravenously. A PCA may be appropriate at this point. It is important to be aware of possible withdrawal symptoms. Some non-pharmacological interventions, like transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or acupuncture, may be appropriate. And the last case scenario. An 87-year-old woman has been admitted with a fractured femur, a history of hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. She is mildly confused. What pain relief can you offer? Take a minute to again pause the video and come up with your own pain relief plan. Now, this case is a little more tricky because the patient has a couple of pre-existing conditions. You would definitely want to start with paracetamol, but due to the woman's age, non anti-inflammatory drugs would almost never be prescribed. In that rare case, a mucoprotective agent should also be given in order to preserve the gastric lining. A femoral nerve block might be administered preoperatively for pain relief. This also lowers the amount of opiates necessary. Ensure IV fluids have been prescribed and urinary output is being monitored. 
oral morphine every three to four hours at regular dose could be another option. However, a PCA would probably not be the best option due to the woman's confusion. A nurse-controlled machine could be substituted in a case like this. As mentioned before, consult with more experienced colleagues if you are ever unsure. We have just covered quite a bit of material. Here are some of the key points from the discussion. Multimodal analgesia is useful in preventing and treating pain. Regular review of the analgesic regimen is important. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are opioid sparing. Use the lowest possible effective dose in combination with a mucoprotective agent, but avoid use with older patients. Intravenous morphine can be used according to your local guidelines. Be sure to consult with seniors, stay with the patient, and titrate small boluses. Always try to maintain the oral analgesic route when possible. Liaise with the acute pain team early on to form the best plan of action. Please refer to the article, Prescribing Analgesia for the Surgical Patient, which can be found on the UCL Medical Students webpage. Here you will also find additional sources used in the making of this video. Podcasts by Brittany Porter, Dr. Robert Stevens, Dr. Maya Nagaratnam, and Dr. Hannah Sutton with contributors Dr. Clarissa Carvalho, Randall Stricker, Judy Goulinau, Rosanna King, Marcia Desjardins, and Mimi Levi. Thanks for watching.